welcome everyone to uh, the exciting October 2023 uh, Eversight webinar. Um, this is a journey in amniotic membrane transplantation for Stevens Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis with Dr. Haji Saeed of University of Illinois Chicago. Um, a few housekeeping things before we introduce Dr. Saeed. Um, first, this webinar, all of our webinars, uh, this one will be recorded. Uh, all of the past ones are recorded and available on demand online. Um, please join us in January is the next webinar we have scheduled. We'll be doing um, uh, Dr. Anthony Aldave of Jules Steiner Institute will be doing a talk on implementing an effective skills transfer program for EK uh, across the globe. Um, all of the participants will be muted for the duration of the webinar tonight, but please do ask questions. You can enter them in the Q&A panel. Um, and we'll uh, answer all of the questions at the end of the webinar. Um, and then at the conclusion of the talk, there'll also be a brief survey. And I'm going to mention that again at the end. And so just a brief introduction of Dr. Saeed. Um, Dr. Saeed is an associate professor of ophthalmology at University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, she also holds part-time appointments at Harvard Medical School and Loyola University Medical Center. After completing cornea fellowship at Mass Ioneer, uh, she stayed on as faculty there for five years, where she was program director of the cornea fellowship, director of the pediatric cornea service, and associate director of the ocular surface imaging center before uh, joining University of Illinois last year. Um, her lab conducts research on characterization and management of Stevens Johnson syndrome with a focus on generic, uh, excuse me, genetic, uh, very different epidemiology and risk factors. Um, she is an international expert on SJS and TEN and has standardized treatment for ocular disease in uh, SJS. Her clinical practice is focused on providing expert care for adult and pediatric patients with severe ocular surface disease. And now I will hand the floor over to her. Thanks so much, Michael, and thank you to Eversight for having me uh, this evening. So thank you and welcome, everyone. Um, so I will be talking about the journey of amniotic membrane transplantation in the acute ocular management of Stevens-Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. Um, disclosures, um, my research is funded by the NEI and the NIH. I also serve as a consultant and expert witness in SJS-10 litigation, not directly uh, related to what I'm going to be talking about today. So this is why we are interested in SJS TEN as ophthalmologists. This is a very severe case of progressive end-stage corneal blindness uh, with complete xerosis, ankle blepharon of the ocular surface. Once an eye reaches this stage, there are very limited options in terms of visual rehabilitation. And we want to prevent the eye from getting to this stage. Um, and that's part of uh, what my talk on acute uh, implementation of a protocol using amniotic membrane transplantation uh, will be about. But it's not just an ocular disease. It's a systemic mucocutaneous disease that affects uh, the rest of the body as well. But there's also a very large public health and quality of life impact and burden. Um, interestingly, even though SJS is a very rare disease uh, with incidence rates of about 1 to 12 per million population, uh, the length of stay for hospitalization for patients with SJS in the acute phase are significantly higher than for other um, admissions um, combined. And the initial cost of inpatient care can be up to $58,000 per patient versus $11,000 for other admissions. And in some total, there's some $43 million spent annually on just the acute care of SJS-10 patients. So for a rare disease, there's a very large and substantial um, health care um, costs associated with the disease. In addition to that, patients are often out of work for weeks, months, sometimes even years while they're recovering, which means that they're out of the workforce, their caregivers are out of the workforce, uh, they need to apply for disability, which has a whole another set of public health impacts as well. Um, another component that is often not thought of is the impact um, that this has on the patient, him or herself, 
um, in terms of the drug which caused the disease. So psychiatric and neurologic drugs are often responsible for the development of SJS. And once those patients can no longer be on that drug, the etiologic drug for their SJS, that can significantly exacerbate mental illness that can no longer be treated with their drug of choice. In addition, because SJS is most often caused by drugs, there is a mistrust in the healthcare system um, and they often will, patients will often delay or not seek care when they need it. So I'm going to start with a brief outline of events from acute to chronic. Um, we'll start with general uh, concepts in acute ocular SJS TEN. And early involvement can be highly variable and can range from conjunctival hyperemia that we see here in the acute phase to pseudomembrane formation, sloughing of the ocular surface with corneal epithelial defect, to eyelid membrane ulceration that you can see here. All of these um, acute stage involvements can result in chronic stage disease, particularly in the setting of um, improper or insufficient acute care. And you can see complete keratinization of the ocular surface with fusion of the eyelid to the ocular surface, symblepharon formation and lumbal stem cell deficiency, and complete conjunctivalization of the ocular surface. So the uh, cases with even modest damage in the acute phase can result in severe chronic ocular surface disease. And the key risk factor for chronic progression appears to be a disordered eyelid margin anatomy. And that can be in the form of entropion, trichiasis, meibomian gland atrophy, eyelid margin notching, and most importantly, posterior eyelid margin keratinization. And I'll show you some photos of that. That is really thought to be the prognosticating factor in SJS um, in terms of corneal blindness and corneal disease. Uh, recently, we have found that there is also drug-related severity. So particular classes of drugs, um, especially anti-epileptics, including lamotrigine, can have very severe acute and chronic ocular uh, disease from SJS. So here you can see this eyelid margin with significant keratinization um, after acute phase of sloughing of the tarsal conjunctiva. And you can see that there was sloughing of the ocular surface um, and the cornea and conjunctiva as well. And this, after rubbing onto the ocular surface through microtrauma over time, can result in keratinization of the ocular surface. And if left untreated, can result in severe um, ocular surface um, scarring, limbal stem cell deficiency, and corneal blindness. So this is where amniotic membrane transplantation comes into place. We can prevent some of these chronic outcomes by effectively implementing a protocol that utilizes amniotic membrane in the acute phase. And although the exact mechanism is unknown, amnion has antimicrobial and immunomodulatory properties and promotes epithelialization. Uh, and that is what allows for um, in increased healing in the acute phase and then preventing chronic phase disease. And it has been shown to reduce eyelid margin keratinization, which again is thought to be the prognosticating factor in the development of severe chronic ocular surface disease. So amniotic membrane was first described in 2002 in uh, the management of acute um, SJS TEN. And it was found that use within the first week of diagnosis of SJS-10 uh, with moderate to severe ocular involvement uh, results in reduction of chronic ocular disease. And that was described in 2011, um, the first report of being used in 10 consecutive cases in the treatment of acute SJS. And it was then also studied in one of the only randomized control trials in this disease because it is so rare um, to be an effective adjuvant therapy in preventing chronic corneal disease and blindness. So we developed an acute management protocol, which involves the use of topical medications and amniotic membrane as listed here. These are the different grades of disease. Grade one being conjunctival hyperemia with no corneal conjunctival or eyelid margin defects, as can be seen here. Grade two, which involves corneal conjunctival or eyelid margin defects without membranes. And I'm sorry, it looks like this photo got a little bit cut off, but you can see that there's corneal epithelial defect here. Um, and it shows that there are no membranes versus this photo, which is grade three, which does show that there are pseudo membranes um, on the tarsal conjunctiva here. 
So amniotic membrane can come in several forms. Uh, one is a Procara ring, uh, which is a symblepharon ring that has an amniotic membrane stretched across it. This can be placed onto the ocular surface, but it must be noted that this device does not cover the eyelid margin. So the area where the most, where the area where um, involvement can cause the most severe ocular surface disease does not get covered by using this ring. This will only cover the cornea and parts of the bulbar conjunctiva, as opposed to the amniotic membrane sheet that is seen over here. Um, this is a sheet that can be placed over the eyelid margin onto the ocular surface, uh, and I'll show some photos of that, and that does address the disease that is um, in the eyelid margin. So how does such a treatment regimen involving the use of amniotic membrane in the acute phase work? Uh, we compared chronic ocular outcomes between SJS patients who did not receive protocol-based acute care and those who did receive the care that I just described in that protocol, and the difference was striking. Um, this is just a table showing that all of the demographic factors were really not different, uh, between the two groups other than the median follow-up, which is expected because we implemented this protocol um, in 2008. And we can see that in almost every category of complication that we found significant differences um, in disease between the two groups. I'm not going to go into the detail of all of this here, but I'm going to show you some graphs showing the visual outcomes between these two groups of patients. So you can see here uh, between two and three years out from the acute onset of SJS, the percentage of eyes maintaining visual acuity greater than or equal to 2200 is less than 50% in the group that did not receive protocol care with amniotic membrane versus 90 something percent in patients who did receive acute care. And we looked at a subset of patients um, who we were followed for uh, four years or more and found even at four years out the significant differences in the number of patients who maintained greater than 2040 vision between each group and also those who lost vision to a level less than 2200 uh, between uh, both groups as well. So amniotic membrane transplantation is a critical part of the treatment regimen, but it is very time and resource intensive. Initially, uh, amniotic membrane was transplanted by securing multiple 3.5 centimeter pieces together with proline suture and then to the eyelids, uh, and uh, including the globe. And that was a very intensive backbreaking procedure. You're in the burn unit. Um, it's very hot because the burn unit is trying to keep all of the, or maintain the fluid status of the patient who is actively um, losing fluid from the mucocutaneous disease. Um, and you're under those lamps trying to suture these small pieces together with a small proline suture. Uh, and it took a very long time. Um, and then biotissue developed a single five by 10 centimeter sheet for each eye, uh, which significantly reduced the time because the sheets did not need to be sutured to one another anymore. Um, but it still did require um, being sutured to the eyelids with bolsters, which I will show you in just a minute. Even with the changes that were implemented, uh, it still had limitations. It still oftentimes required an operating room procedure in acutely ill patients. The time to the procedure may be delayed in trying to coordinate that care in the operating room, and the length of time for the procedure was still significant as well. So this is an example of the sutured amniotic membrane technique. The amniotic membrane is placed onto um, the eyelid, several millimeters above the eyelid margin. It's secured with bolsters. And then you can see that the amniotic membrane is then draped over the ocular surface onto the skin. A symblepharon ring is then used to push the amniotic membrane into the superior fornix. Same thing is done to the inferior fornix and then it is attached to the lower eyelid with bolsters again. So we developed a glued technique to prevent or to address some of the limitations that I had just mentioned with the suture technique. Um, and it's a very similar technique. It just involves glue instead of sutures. So you can see here that we use amniotic membrane, again, several millimeters above the eyelid margin. Cyanoacrylate glue is used to secure the membrane to the eyelid, 
A symblepharon ring is again used to push the amniotic membrane into the superior and inferior fornices. And then the amniotic membrane is attached to the eyelid skin with cyanoacrylate glue again. So how does this glue technique compare to a sutured amniotic membrane? So we looked at that and again, did not find any significant differences in our baseline demographics between those two patients. Um, I'm sorry, between the two groups, the group that received a sutured AMT and the group that received a glued AMT. There were significant um, differences that we found, particularly in the amniotic membrane uh, treatment uh, procedure duration, which was not unexpected, uh, but we did want to systematically study this um, to show the differences between the two groups. So when we used to use the two pieces that were sutured together, it would take about an hour um, to do this in each eye. Then when it, the full sheet became available on this the sheets did not need to be sutured together. Um, that dropped to about 36 minutes in either eye. And then when we switched to the glue technique, very significant decrease in the amount of time that it took for the procedure, nine and a half minutes. There were not any differences in terms of the ocular severity um, or other factors that you can see here. And then the chronic results, which are also uh, very um, heartening, is that the development of severe ocular complications was not significantly different between the two groups and the visual acuity was similar between the two groups and not statistically significantly different. So the glued method of the amniotic membrane may eliminate the need for general anesthesia, reduce the time to the procedure, reduce the length of the procedure itself, reduce discomfort because there is less tissue manipulation and reduce cost and resources because now this procedure can almost universally be done at the bedside and does not require going to the operating room uh, because it is such a short procedure um, and has very minimal pain associated with it since no sutures are being used. Um, there are some unique considerations to take into account. Um, I've been asked many times about what type of glue can be used, and I want to stress that it must be cyanoacrylate glue that is used. Um, to seal fibrin glue or other um, glue formulations uh, do not adhere well to epithelialized skin, um, and they will fall off. And even when they do, um, even if the skin is denuded and you are able to apply the glue to the de-epithelialized skin, it will fall off uh, within a few days. So cyanoacrylate glue must be used. Um, however, um, cyanoacrylate glue is toxic to the ocular surface, as many of you know and may use in your own practices. Um, when there is a corneal perforation that is small enough um, to be sealed with glue, um, the glue is placed on the ocular surface, and over time, there is intense neovascularization that develops um, towards that area of the glue. Um, so it must be applied three to four millimeters above the eyelid margin because of that toxicity and care must be taken to not get the glue onto the surface of the eye. Um, these eyes are already acutely inflamed, so any other form of toxicity to the ocular surface can really cause the patient to go downhill. In addition, the glue is very abrasive and will be very painful um, if it is inadvertently left on the ocular surface um, every time that the patient blinks. Um, additionally, um, the glue does fall off on its own, um, similar to the ocular surface when you place it on uh, to the cornea in cases of perforation, the epithelium grows underneath and eventually that glue will dislodge. The same thing happens on the, on the eyelid where the epithelium will grow underneath the glue and it will then fall off on its own. Sometimes there is a residual glue that is left and that can be wiped off with an adhesive remover wipe. Uh, we have those in clinic. Um, and, and they can be ordered if, if, they, if you don't, um, and it comes off very easily. So there are no um, concerns with the glue adhering to the skin long-term or causing any further um, cutaneous damage. So in conclusion, ophthalmologists must examine all SJS10 patients upon admission, and amniotic membrane transplantation has a window of opportunity. As I mentioned, it's been found that amniotic membrane transplantation must be done within that first week of admission to really have the greatest effect on mitigating chronic ocular complications. Um, and even within that week, the earlier it's done, the better, because we see significant progression of acute inflammation in that first week after disease onset. 
And a treatment protocol using amniotic membrane can significantly reduce ocular morbidity. But even then, it's still not a panacea. So even in the patients um, in whom we did use this protocol, there are a select uh, few who do go on to develop very severe ocular surface disease. And so this means that patients must be followed closely because complications can develop at any time, even three to four years later, which can develop into severe chronic disease leading to blindness. Um, and every phase of the disease does have a window of opportunity in which different um, interventions can be made. Uh, and finally, the glued amniotic membrane transplantation can potentially lower the threshold for the use of AMT um, in Steven Johnson syndrome or other diseases such as um, ocular chemical or thermal burns or acute uh, graft versus host disease where there is significant involvement of the eyelid um, and or ocular surface. Uh, and this method can be applied to uh, safely, efficiently, and effectively apply amniotic membrane um, to the ocular surface at the bedside. Uh, I want to thank everyone so much for their time. Um, this is one of my patients um, who saw me um, in the chronic phase who unfortunately did not receive um, appropriate acute care, acute phase care, and just developed severe ocular surface disease, complete xerosis, this large tongue of conjunctivalization of the ocular surface is very limited options for this patient now. Um, just to give a brief um, history for this patient, we did do a minor salivary gland transplantation on this patient to prepare the eye for either limbal stem cell transplantation or um, a K-PRO. Uh, but both of those procedures, as you know, have um, their own set of complications, and we really want to prevent getting to this stage. And even though it is not 100% effective, we do know that amniotic membrane um, is one of the most powerful resources we have in preventing um, this type of severe chronic disease. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed. Um, we have one question in the chat, and then I have a quick one too. I'll, I'll just ask while people, um, uh, maybe people type more, we'll give them a second. Um, so you, with the glue technique, you can place this at the bedside, not the OR. Um, what do you do to um, protect the eye after it's glued on? Do you just shield um, shield the eye? Um, th that's a great question. Um, so if the patient is awake, they may be blinking enough that you don't need to have any additional support onto the ocular surface. Many times, most of the time, um, in the acute phase, these patients are intubated or sedated um, and do not have that protective mechanism over the surface. So it's very important to size the sublepharon ring um, so that it fits appropriately in the fornices so that the eyelid can still close over the eye. Um, and then copious ointment and medications are used and eye drops are used on the surface to protect the, protect, um, the ocular surface. I'm trying to go back on my slides here so I can show you. Sure. This, uh, here we go. Um, so ointment, um, fluoromethylone ointment, which is a steroid ointment, is used six times a day. And there's really copious amounts of that ointment that we use. Um, so that allows um, protection of the ocular surface in addition to the amniotic membrane. Now, eyes that do have more exposure that are not being closed or protected as much will have faster dissolution of the amniotic membrane. Mm. Thank you. Um, and uh, the other question I had, and you may have said this, forgive me if you did, is um, this is the amniotic membrane sheet placed with the basement membrane side onto the ocular surface and stromal side? Um, um, so yeah, another good question. It's usually actually placed stromal side onto the ocular surface and the basement membrane facing up. Uh, but we have actually found in other disease states that um, it really doesn't matter which way we place okay. it, uh, but the standard is to place it with the stromal side down. Okay. And then um, question from the chat. Um, uh, so were the, you mentioned that the procedures, the gluing procedures can be done bedside. Um, the uh, suturing procedure, is that done in the OR? And then part two of that question, do you have a preferred um, type of amniotic membrane in terms of brand or preservation, um, et cetera? 
Um, so it does not have to be done in the operating room. And we actually rarely do it in the operating room. Um, if we can, with sedation at the bedside in the ICU where these patients usually are, uh, we try to do it at the bedside just because it's faster, the patient gets the procedure closer to the time of their onset, um, and there's a lot less coordination with having to go to the operating room. Um, but in conversations with many other ophthalmologists, I found that um, doing that local conscious sedation that is needed is oftentimes not available, even in the ICU setting. Um, and in those cases, the patient does need to be taken to the operating room um, because it's difficult, even with local sedation, um, the patients can be quite uncomfortable with the, with the procedure. So it does not need to be, but if the proper um, sedation and analgesia is not available, then it does need to be done in the operating room. As far as brand and type, um, I use the uh, bio tissue cryopreserved amniotic membrane. Um, there is a dried version of the membrane. Um, I have not actually personally used it. I know that there are others who use it, but I don't think that that's going to be as effective as a cryopreserved membrane. Um, and I use the five by 10 centimeter sheet um, that bio tissue has. Do you use the, um, I think it's amniograft, like the amniograft. mid thickness? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They do have a, 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 a thicker one that came out recently. Um, I have not yet used that in, in this population, uh, but it would probably last on the ocular surface longer. Uh, and that may be a benefit since the amniotic mm -hmm. membrane does dissolve um, faster in acute inflammatory states. So having a thicker one may, may provide some benefits. Mm. And let me just take a look. That looks like... Um... All the questions that we had in the chat. Um, and so, um, barring any last minute submissions, uh, get them in now if you have them. Uh, this uh, webinar, like I said, will be available online on our website, on YouTube, available on demand. Um, there's going to be a brief uh, survey. As soon as uh, the webinar ends, it's going to populate on your phone or computer or whatever. Please. Uh, uh, it really helps us to get feedback. Please uh, fill that out if you have the time. Um, any uh, final words to share, Dr. Say? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. This uh, is a disease that is rare as a disease that no ophthalmologist wants to see in their practice because of how difficult it is to treat. Uh, but there are ways in the acute phase to really prevent some of this chronic disease. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to present that. Thank you. Thank you. We're grateful to have you. Um, and to now have you at one of our favorite partner institutions at the University yeah. of Illinois. Um, uh, thank you, everybody, for logging on. Uh, we'll see you at the next webinar. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye.